very happy to have Mark Sarabian here. Uh, Mark has been an awesome connector for us here at uh, Meetup New York City. Several of the people uh, we contacted to present here, we also met through Mark. We appreciate it. Excited to learn about his um, project that's been instrumental in New York City, AT Help, today, and look forward to a good uh, conversation. We should have time for some Q&A after the talk as well. Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, hopefully you can hear me. This is the first time I've been upright in like two weeks. Um, I'm not contagious, it's just asthma is not a nice thing, and I have my voice back just in time. My wife is like, how are you gonna talk tomorrow? I don't know, I'll, I'll wing it, thank God for a microphone though. Um, I run AT Help. I've been doing assistive tech for 30 years in Chicago and New York, and it dawned on me that I was only helping one kid at a time. And, and I wasn't really getting anywhere. There were so many children to help with regards to assistive technology. And yet, I couldn't, lectures weren't going to be enough. What would I do? So I thought, could I open a free clinic? So I opened up an internet cafe back when they were almost still popular and it was all waning. It's too bad, I just kind of slow starter, you know? And we opened it up in Harlem and it was an, it was a internet cafe that claimed it could serve anyone. Uh, a person who was deaf came in once and asked me how, you know, we could help him and we set up a screen so we could talk to five friends at once, which was pretty progressive 10 years ago. You know, another person came in who was blind and wanted to know how to use something. I think back then they called it, um, what's called smart box or something. It was a box that would read their emails to them. A man came in who could not speak or move any part of his body except his eyes. And we had to investigate that one. So that's when we discovered eye tracking and we invited people in that did eye tracking. We served anybody we could for free. What was cool is that it was integrated. Everybody in the community found a place to hang out. And Luke and I were talking before today started, your first speaker, and we realized that for every step forward, sometimes in the tech world we take a couple back. When the internet was invented, when I was in college, yes, that's how old I am, and I teach at Pace, and my students are always funny. You know, Mr. Sarabian, see, your generation, and I love to correct them really quickly, my generation invented the computer, so why don't you sit down and pay attention? <laughs> you know, I'm Steve Jobs' age, for God's sakes. <laughs> Give us a little credit. Um, so, so anyway, what, um, what kills me is that, well, here, let me just get to our, our point here, is that the, the cafe died, okay? But the idea lived on. And what we did is we created a free place for people to come and get assistive tech help so that everybody could participate. Oh, what I was talking about two steps ahead and, and one step backwards is when the internet was invented, it was text-based. People with vision impairments were like, yes, things can be read to me. And then the rest of you were unsatisfied. We needed it to be graphically based. Great, two steps backwards. Now what are these graphics doing there on my screen? So this is what happens all the time in our field because we don't have enough foresight. The lessons you're getting today, it's not about the tech. It's about your foresight. It's about the way you think. It's about who you envision to be part of your community. That is the only thing that matters here. The tech really doesn't matter. Question to all of you. Are these forms of assistive technology? I don't think I need to educate you on what that is. You probably all know. But are these forms of assistive tech? They're not. They're not, that's not what they were developed for. None of these were developed for our community. Don't fool yourselves. They were developed for a lazy general population that wanted to talk to their computer, you know, or wanted to be able to touch things instead of using a mouse, or wanted to record things because whatever they said was that important. And of course, the lazy people like me like to drive and listen to an audio book. By the way, I don't really recommend that because especially in New York, because you get so caught up in a good book that you forget you're driving, you know, at times. <laughs> Anyway, they weren't invented for us, but we adopted them. We're always paying attention to the world around us to see how can that help the people we serve. That's what's cool about the assistive tech field because what Tom Harkin and those people did is they had this big vision of what assistive tech could be. Assistive tech isn't a thing. It's anything. This is really important. It's anything. It could be a piece of paper used correctly, that divides a screen, that divides a keyboard for a child that has visual problems so that they can separate their hands when they're typing. That is used to increase, maintain, or improve 
the functional capabilities of a person with a disability. That's what it is. So really, it, it's all about a vision. That's what assistive tech is. Now, we've got money, we have need. The problem is assistive tech just isn't fully utilized. It's been around for actually over 100 years, but in the formal way that we know, it's about 30 years old. That's when we all started organizing and talking about it and giving it a real name. I work in the education system. This is what I face every day. AT is a crutch, a false promise, a dependency. It's cheating. I hear this from young educators, millennials who I thought would be a little bit more savvy, but still want that kid that has a handwriting problem to learn how to do it the way I did. Really? I'd expect that from my generation, not from theirs, but I see it all the time. So it's not, let me, let me just explain something. My favorite one is crutch. What's a crutch? A crutch is something to get up from a sitting position and move forward. It's not something to lean on and stay there all day. That's not what a crutch is. So when they abuse us with the word crutch, I laugh and go, crutch is empowerment. You get up and move forward. So I embrace that. I embrace that what we do is give kids crutches to move forward. The problem with our system is that it's a medical model. If you ever looked at what's called an IEP, an educational plan for children with disabilities, it says he has CP, he has blindness, he has, you know, he has a, a learning disability. Yes, that's your medical description. It doesn't help me as a teacher. It doesn't help me as a parent. What IEP should tell us is he can't participate in class and why. That's the issue. The issue is one of participation. John Hockenberry is in a wheelchair, great reporter. John Hockenberry in Washington, D.C. really doesn't have a significant disability because he can fly on those cement sidewalks. You send him to Iraq in the middle of a war zone on a bad weather day, and his disability is far more apparent because mobility is impaired. So it's about whether you can participate. It's not the medical classification of disability. It's irrelevant. And that's how we have to rewrite things. We have to rewrite things and think, how are kids not participating? How can we change that? And that's what the technology does. It's all about participation. We fought for years about a concept of inclusion. Kids should be included in the classroom. One of my students, Justin, was included. And he got all, this compu all these computers and everything. Is he fixed? Is he OK? He's a quadriplegic. He um, uses his fingers a little bit to type, but mostly his voice. And he just graduated from CUNY this year. If anybody uh, needs to hire somebody, mathematics degree in computer science. And Justin's looking for a job. Another real challenge for people with disabilities right now. 70% unemployment. Not seven, 70. And they thought because they put him in a class with his able-bodied peers, that they called them, he was included. Nobody taught him how to use computer. Nobody adapted it. Nobody made it useful. And it sat there and got dusty until somebody made it work. And then he participated. For the first time, he had a book read to him so that he could learn to become a reader. And he's moved on and done well for himself. Here's a friend of his, case in point. This is Randy. Randy's a public figure, so I'm using his name freely with his permission. This is Randy when he was about third grade. He couldn't speak. He couldn't hold a pen. His hands doesn't have a five motor. He can't read or write. He really couldn't focus. My gosh, if you didn't breathe hard, Randy would turn around. Talk about attention issues. And his psychological report didn't say this. The term we used in my time was mental retardation, which was far worse. I'm not too thrilled with this either. He has an intellectual disability. My question has always been, OK, psychologist. I love my peers in that realm. <laughs> How did you determine that he has an intellectual disability? He can't write, he can't read, he can't talk, he can't manipulate a pen or any objects in any part of your test. He can't do your test. We interpreted it, Mark. You certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> this way. I interpreted it this way and said, I presume confidence. 
Question. Yeah, I was wondering if that definition, is that from uh, DSM-3 or something, or whatever version is it from, or whether it's I, I don't know if they're using that now, but the school systems are using intellectual disability as opposed to mental retardation. It's much more fashionable. It doesn't mean that it's retarded, that it's slowed or delayed. It means that it just is. It's just what well, it is. I was just wondering if there was yeah. a formal like, definition because of some tests or something, you know, whatever. That I think they just like that term a lot. Oh, okay. explain it. Yeah. Anyway, if you look at the new neuroscience, even the differentiated instruction we do, even the fact that we have all these different types of learning, I'm an audio learner, I'm a visual learner, that's all a lot of crap. <laughs> look at the new neuroscience, it's a load of crap. It ha it, this is what happens, neuroscience makes us advance and teaching gets it 20 years later. It, it, it's that delayed. We all learn the same way, your brain functions the same way, everybody does the same thing. Now, we have greater or lesser physical or sensory strengths, true. That's not going to change the way the stuff's coming in or coming out. But your access to it does. How can you see it? How can you manipulate it? How can you use it? So it's all about access. It's all about participating. It's all about physically being involved with your learning materials, or visually, or, or auditorily. So the way we work is we presume confidence. We presume that a child can be a learner. What else? I mean, I'm 50 years old. But I'm 54. I lie. I look younger if I say 50. You know. um, I went back to school at 50. If you don't presume confidence in individuals, then you're saying a 50-year-old can't go back to school. That learning just magically stops at 21 when you get that college degree and there's no more. It, no, it doesn't work that way. We never stop learning. So we have to presume confidence. We have to enhance participation. And my argument with the technology is that change comes. And like I said, participation is, is defined by the accessibility to the curriculum. So, what can happen if you change my level of access? That's my question. So that's what we do with assistive tech. We keep trying to improve that child's access to the curriculum, to participate, to participate. Where are the weaknesses in participation? This is what can happen. This is what happened to Randy, okay? He learned to communicate with an augmentative communication device. I remember him being nine years old and going, I don't know, I don't anymore. And I'm like, yeah, you yeah, kind of do because I didn't understand that full sentence. He's like, okay, I'll keep using it. But you know, he was learning to verbally communicate. He was learning to express himself. But he had been, he'd been using the device since he was four to communicate in a symbolic way so that cognitively he could participate and learn until his voice, if it did, ever caught up. We don't have time to worry about when things are going to catch up for a person with disability. They need to be participating now. And that's what we did. We gave them a voice. We have gave him tools to type and to write. We kept presuming confidence, even when he was only doing 50% of what his peers were doing freshman year of school. And the teacher's like, he doesn't belong here. Funny story. The high school, um, head of high school, uh, special ed wouldn't let Randy into the inclusion program. I'm like, he's been in inclusion his whole life. Please cut him some slack. So I said, give him a week. She said, all right. Calls me the next day. She said, Mark, he's brilliant. I said, brilliant? Yeah, well, we have this computer in the teacher's lounge, and Randy fixed it. It's been broken for weeks. <laughs> they, they made him eat lunch in the, in the teacher's lounge because they didn't think it was safe for people in the mainstream population. So I call Randy on the phone, and Randy's like, hey, Randy, what did you do? I, I plugged it in. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, don't tell anybody. Okay, okay, I don't tell. Don't tell anybody ever what you did. <laughs> and he got into the program and he stayed. The senior year, he was doing trigonometry. I can't even spell trigonometry. So the students Here's Randy. had no chance of passing even the most basic oh, standard. What if we could get more sound of the program? Now you're 19. What?
private joke between Randy and I. He loves all those movies. So he started impersonating Arnold. And he used to do it really, really well. But that's his just R3, which is what my voice sounds like today. So it's really hard for Randy to speak. But he's gained greater strength over the years. He's over at BMCC now studying. Um, he doesn't know what he wants to do. He's doing computer science. But a lot of our kids get into the tech industry. Um, to us, the term disability really shouldn't describe the person on an educational plan. It should describe the environment. Now, that's a big debate. If you're a person with a disability, you say, Mark, don't dismiss my disability and say that it doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the way we talk about you, we shouldn't be talking about you as a person. We should be talking about your involvement in the community, in the environment. The, the, your, your experience is disabled. We can fix environments. This is really important. So technology, to me, it's not a thing. It's a way to see. It's a way of how can we change things. Now, I'm going to be really obnoxious right now. I'm going to say, right in the middle here. It's really hard to see one. I mean, it's really well. Anybody got I, I made it so accessible. I know, of course. <laughs> I made it lying in bed the other day. Handwriting, reading, writing, calculations, and memorizing are overrated. I say this to literacy groups all the time. Reading is overrated. Mark, how dare you? <laughs> it is. I know a lot of blind people that don't read. Mark, that's not the same. No, it is the same thing. It's not the mechanics of reading. It's the ability to process the information you get into yourself by whatever means. That's what it is. It's taking in information. It's expressing yourself about it. It's thinking about it. That's what learning is. But this is what we penalize kids for. If a kid has a low incidence disability, which means like dyslexia, I mean a high incidence disability like dyslexia, we don't see those disabilities. So therefore, he's going to learn to write cursive. I got a letter last night. Uh, Mark, my son's been held back because his cursive and his, and his, you know, you know, his, his writing and so forth is, is really limited. Although he speaks really well, they really want him to work on this. <laughs> work on what? The mechanics of what? Let, let me get some support from this guy, Socrates. He's kind of important. <laughs> I was over in the Met the other day, and I took a picture of him. I went, where's his nose, first off? But anyway, <laughs> the joke in our community is Socrates was dyslexic, dysgraphic, and had ADHD. He never stopped talking. He got in trouble with the law. He was a blue-collar worker who developed things, and he never wrote anything. That sounds like a lot of guys I know that have dyslexia, dysgraphia, and ADHD. And he himself said that writing destroyed thinking. Because when, as soon as you wrote it down, it couldn't be interpreted. It could be interpreted in many different ways by many different people. But the only person that really knew what that meant was the person who wrote it. He said that it's about speaking. That's what it's about. It's about thinking. And the irony is we based our whole educational system on this dude, and he never wrote anything. We're still debating what his students wrote about him. <laughs> so the, the thing that's important to me is that if you're an educator, that you have a lens. You already do. And that your lens affects the way you serve your students. If you presume confidence, if you see capability, OK, then you'll know what to do. And, and my argument is that technology can impact that lens. I believe that you can have a typical pedagogy with your typical tools and your typical students. But every now and then, you're going to run into a barrier for one student. Your pedagogy doesn't have to end. This is where the private schools get in trouble. Mark, we will help remediate again. Yes, in two, three, four, five years. He has homework tonight. That's the problem. His self-esteem as a learner is going down today. I want to empower him with the tools so that he keeps learning along your pathway. And that's what assistive tech, assistive tech does. Lifts you up, keeps you going. We have assistive tech for all of these areas, from phonemic awareness and handwriting to the physical manipulation of math and science materials. We have assistive tech for processing challenges, for organization, retention, problem solving. We have tools for every mechanical thing that a student's obligated to do in a classroom. 
And finally, the one you're most familiar with is we have assistive tech for output, for graph and motor, which is handwriting, spelling, written expression. You know that word prediction you have on your phone? It sucks. We have good word prediction. We have word prediction that if you're reading the wimpy kid like my eight-year-old nephew, word prediction pops up with all the names of the characters in the wimpy kid books. You don't have that on your phone, do you? Try it if you don't have it. So, but it's, it's amazing, the stuff that we have in our field. So my attitude to you is AT is not really a thing. It's a way of thinking. It's an orientation. And I want to fly through a couple, because we only have a few minutes. But I want to fly through a couple of the assistive tech things that we have. But we have assistive tech for all of these areas and more. Learning disabilities, neurological challenges, physical mobility challenges, communication, hearing and, vis hearing and visual challenges. We have assistive tech to serve anyone. But remember this, they're not coming to me as a person with a particular medical definition of a disability. They're coming to me as a person that can participate. That means that a child who's blind, a child who's dyslexic, and a child with a physical disability could conceivably all have the same school-based disability. They can't manipulate the textbook. So their real disability in the school is they can't manipulate a textbook. Find them an accessible textbook. Done. It has nothing to do with what we're classifying medically. We're trying to solve a problem, and that's not how we think. Over at my website, uh, I'm hoping you guys are bloggers, developers. I'm open to suggestions. I'm trying to find a new platform to deliver better content. Well, we got a lot of stuff, a lot of dead links. According to a lot of my students with autism who support, I have a lot of volunteers with disabilities, so my students with autism love to analyze all my dead links, and they find all of them. Things. I got a lot of them. Um, the first thing I want you to, to think about is system tech. I'm just going to fly through a couple. Are the built-in features to absolutely every device that's out there. It's free. And that's all educators really need to know, is that everything from their phone to the computers has all these built in, and I have it on my website, built in features, you know, in, in Windows. Oh, incredible ones in Windows, actually, we don't appreciate that. Apple. Even in Google Chrome, a lot of built in features, because Chrome is an operating system, even though it can play on any computer. Um, the iPad, amazing things. As a matter of fact, my favorite is um, guided access. Does anyone know what guided access is? Okay, does anyone have a child? You better learn what guided access is if you have a child. You can lock them into one place on the iPad. They can't go anywhere else. So cool. And, and so we fought for that with the autism community with Apple. And they kept saying, no, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. Oh, we won. So if you press your iPad three times in the home button, it'll lock out the iPad so the kid can't go anywhere except where you said. Pretty cool. Kids with autism typically know how to get out of there really fast. That's why we invented it, so they can't go anywhere. Anyway, like I said, we've got tools for writing. I'll leave this, um, I'll leave this with anybody that wants it up and online, but lots of note-taking tools that are out there. Lots of organizational tools that are out there. Reading supports. Um, just digital books in general are amazing. And, and please ignore all the studies that come from my generation of academics, OK? Ignore them all, especially the ones that say that reading, well, college students prefer paper over digital. Yes, because the kids that are in college now had paper their whole lives, you idiots. Let's wait till we get a full digital generation to do that study. My god. But if you're in college, you're saving 30% of the book because it's digital. When your professor is dumb enough to say, find these terms in your book, I can search for them. Boy, that's a really bad professor. Um, I can highlight, extract, I can put notes in it. Talk about a rich text, digital text. And I don't have to, you know what it was like for college for me carrying books? And for you guys, iPad, right? I mean, there's your books. This is amazing. So amazing supports in the digital realm. These are a lot of, uh, this one, Orcam, still working its bugs out. But its claim is to help people with vision impairments or dyslexia read. Because as you aim the glasses at anything, it reads what's in front of you. And it tells you in your ear. It's really quite beautiful. Got a lot of bugs, but it's, it's, it's getting there. Reading supports, as we said. Lots of things that I thought I'd actually get to, but no, not too much. Um, OK. Lots of wonderful reading supports you can look at later if you want. 
books that I made, visual books. PowerPoint's great to make books for kids. Math tools, tons of manipulatives, um, and tools that embed themselves into Microsoft Word now, so people can, because kids have word problems, so well, they don't just do math. So kids that can't write these characters can actually do the math. Justin, to get his mathematics degree, because he's part of music, uses um, math talk. He actually speaks math. I don't know how you speak math. Um, <laughs> math tools for the iPad and so forth. The final group of apps are really amazing, and we put a whole bunch of them together in the chrometoolbox.com because Chrome apps are growing fast. And the beauty about assistive tech in the cloud is it follows you wherever you go. So you sign in anywhere, all your assistive tech comes to you. It's not perfect yet, but it's a growing way of doing assistive tech. You'll find them in the Google Store, which the guys at Google have always told me is, has the worst search engine on Earth. You can't find anything in the Google Store. They joke about it. They said there's only one worse search engine than that one. That's the one in their office. I, I swear to you, they say the one in the office is horrible. Anybody work for Google? I don't know if that's true, but they say that they have a horrible search engine in the office. Anyway, lots of apps, lots of add-ons now to Google Docs where you can talk to Google Docs. You can do math embedded into Google Docs, organizational tools in Google Docs. And of course, Microsoft is stepping up their game right now too. Um, so like I said, there's more there. Last one to show you is this little guy. And I was told that he couldn't use a communication device because he wasn't cognitively able. He was five years old, he had Down syndrome. And the speech therapist told me that he couldn't do this, Mark, so why are you, why are you trying? He does not cognitively able to understand symbolic communication. Have you ever seen a two-year-old on an iPad? So what do you do when a speech therapist interferes with your attempt to do that? Well, you wait till she goes to lunch. <laughs> and you go in and you prove that this little boy was ticked off that I'm demanding that he communicate instead of use his behavior that he wants. Look at that little attitude. And he shows me exactly what he wants. He wants goldfish. That's what every preschooler wants. I know there's goldfish. So do I, but I'm too old to do it. But um, oh, experiment's over because he sees he's on camera and it's all over. Uh oh, it's all over. Anyway. We have tools for communication as well that are, are underrated. I just want to say that AT is a way of thinking. It's, it's not, it's, I could sit here and teach about all these tools, but like Luke said in the beginning, they all change. They all change. They're always going to be changing. I need to teach you, if you want to do this, that it's about your orientation, the way you look at a person. And if you're fixing their participation level, you don't have to worry about what their disability is. You have to worry about where they can't participate. And that could be at your job. It could be in school. It could be in the community, your local bar. It could be the fact that NYU has the most beautiful facility here that's marked really well for people with disabilities. Beautiful stalls in there. So the person in a wheelchair can actually use the stalls and use the bathroom really well. There's only one problem. They can't get out of the bathroom. There's no exit button to open that door. Anybody ever think about that? You can get in. You just can't get out. So let's work on that. Anyway. Um, I'm open to any questions you might have about assistive tech. Thanks, guys. Oh, um, and if you want to see a really cool movie about a bunch of kids I know with disabilities had their own conference, it's on YouTube. I'll leave that up. You can search for it. Um, these kids were in their own conference. That's Justin, who just graduated. That's Randy, who's in college. Tom, who just passed four of his regents. He's nonverbal. He's passed four of his regents so far at the lab school. And Abraham, who's at the University of Virginia on a full ride, severely dysgraphic, dyslexic, and worked uh, this summer for, as an intern for the mayor's office for disabilities. He's an amazing young man who wants to be president. I hope he isn't, because he has some very scary ideas. <laughs> and we've had enough of those lately, so. Um, but thanks, guys. Leave that up. Mark, I sure. Uh, any, just from doing AT help in the community, yeah. I think it always comes down to um, the, the, the most profound thing that happens. 2,500 kids have come through there. And I wish I had done a study. Because the most profound thing that happens is a gestalt. I don't think I fix the situation most of the time. What I fix is the conversation. Kid comes in, and I usually let them speak first. And the parents say, you know, try to jump and say, psychologist said, the teacher said, you know, my, my doctor said, and he's been through this battery of tests, 
And then the child says, yeah, you know, Mark, I, I can't do A, B, or C. And then I show them a tool that solves that situation. It doesn't matter if he can have it or not. What matters is he now believes that there's a solution. And the gestalt happens, and he walks out with a smirk. And the mothers or fathers call and say, Mark, I don't know what you did today because I don't think we solved it. But he's happier because he knows that there's another path. And that's all that matters. He'll find it. But we are the ones that step on the kids, even in a nice way, and go, it's OK. Your handwriting will get better. He's six. Leave him alone. <laughs> it should be, it's OK. Hey, handwriting, we can try typing later. Hey, either way, you're going to express yourself. Right now, you can dictate me and tell me what you want to write for this story. But we don't do that. And so it's that gestalt. I think that's the most profound thing I've learned from all of this. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, hi. Hi. Maybe this is something to discuss later. With sure. Him. But I have a friend who's going to lose funding for his IG, the computer where he looks yeah. at the talk. And my kid doesn't want to pay for it anymore. So we need to find alternate ways of funding or, or like an IG app or something. Let's definitely talk about it. OK. Absolutely. Oh, well, I actually, we actually broadened our scope now to serve adults, too. So I'll see them for free, Great. which is really neat that we can see adults for free. Because uh, my sister has MS, and I got to tell you, nobody supports the MS Society for assistive tech. So we need to sort of support the adult community, too. I mean, there are a lot of organizations in town that will support them through billing and so forth, but there are two months of wait. People need to talk about it now. So that's what we're there for, if you need to talk about it now. Um, and we're also supporting professional groups now. So if, if you're an advocacy group or an education group and you want to come and learn about how you can help your kids, as long as you're helping a specific clientele of people, we'll help you for free. And I say we because I have a lot of volunteers of my students. They volunteer. That's how they get their high school hours. It's pretty brilliant. So Tom's helping right now. Tom's a lot bigger than that now. And he's helping um, support.